And good morning, everyone, and welcome to Small Biz Matters, the half-hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. My name is Alexi Boyd. So let's talk today about a very niggling topic. I'm going to cover three things today, not to sort of bombard you with too much information. And like I said, this is this is what we will be delivering at the seminar next Monday at the Pimble Golf Club. So hiring an employee is is fraught because we all understand that there's regulations around workplace relations. We understand that there's regulations around how to hire someone, payroll, um, induction procedures, work health and safety. And quite a lot of times that puts people off. Now, that's not great for the Australian economy. We need to be hiring people because it's important that people have a regular source of income. If the whole economy operated with contractors in place, then nobody would really know and be able to foresee what's going on with the economy or their own personal um, household budget as well. So it's really important when you're thinking about hiring employees that you do get it right, but don't be afraid or put off by it because there are quite a lot of places out there that you can go to for help. Might I just say before I continue that it's very important when you are searching and researching for things, not just about employment, but in general on the internet, that you don't stumble upon a website which very much looks like a government website and behaves like a government website, but is not. And they will produce a sales funnel that will push you towards buying a cheap report or top tips um, for say $29 or $30 or something like that. It'll make you think that you're buying something that's official. Um, More than likely, the information is going to be correct, but nothing on a government website that is information-based will sell you anything. So just make sure that whatever you're looking at when you're trying to find proper information and accurate information has the, 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 the suffix .gov.au. It's very important because we see a lot of, well, apart from the fact we see a lot of scams. I mean, the scams have just been in the news again this week. Uh, some people were being scammed by, what was the latest one I heard about? The ATO ringing people up and telling them to pay off their debts using iTunes cards that you buy from Woolies and Coles, whatever, and then you you send them to this particular address. I mean, that's amazing. And they've, they've made hundreds of thousands of dollars from people who have been buying these iTunes cards. I mean, so it, to the point where you might have noticed that the, the major supermarkets have had to put up signs saying, do not purchase these if you are buying it to pay off an ATO debt. I always have, and I digress a little bit here, but I'm just trying to give you some tips here about how to deal with scammers. I always, always have a double uh, check system. It's not enough for someone to call you, claim to be that they're from the ATO, and then they give you a number to call back because they say, <clears throat> which we're legitimate, here's the number if you want to call back, and here's the reference number. That's fine. You just got to call back into the same call centre, which is not actually the ATO. The double check system is to supposedly take down the reference number and then actually call a general 13 number for the ATO and check your reference number that way. More than likely, it's going to be uh, incorrect. Um, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it is legitimate, but quite often it's not. You've just got to be so careful. And don't click on anything, even from people within your contacts list that you are not expecting. If you're ex- not expecting an email from them that's an AGL uh, bill, for example, there's quite a few people have been stung by these AGL bills. Uh, if you're not expecting anything, or even if you are expecting something um, and you're not used to seeing that particular communication from that corporate or from that uh, person, then just pick up the phone and say, hey, did you just send me something? I had a friend who was an accountant who uh, had an email that went out to her entire database, which was massive, that actually said, I've invited you into my Gmail folder. And that was it. It was a legitimate Gmail folder, but it wasn't her sending it. And it, it was filled with a virus as well to access people's G drive. So if you're not expecting anything from someone, pick up the phone and check with them. And that often does them a favor as well, because um, there's nothing worse as, than a, as a small business having your files corrupted and your client base accessed and then you looking like you're not on the front foot. Uh, and and keeping control of that. So you're doing everyone a favour just by reporting these things if you've got time, of course, but more importantly, do not open anything you're not expecting. You can't even say don't even open it from someone you don't know. That's not even the case anymore. Don't open anything you're not expecting. Okay, I digress badly. Uh, What I was just going to talk about then was, um, in fact, hiring your first employee. So let's go through a couple of tips. Now, I'm only going to just brush over these. Um, For more information, I would definitely come along to the free session next week on Monday night. So let's talk about um, 
advertising the role. First step. Step one, advertising the role. Now, the first thing you need is a job description. And a job description could be as simple as 10 bullet points that you are expecting that person to undertake. If it's a job description that is typical, that you know other people or a professional association that you belong to, that people typically hire, there will be somewhere a description of that job online. So I know that seek.com.au is a great way to look up job descriptions because that's how people advertise other jobs. So you can be going to those other jobs and just basically cutting and pasting what those bullet points might be. Um, So that's one option. And the other option, of course, is to write it yourself and check with your professional association because that's the sort of tools that they should be providing their members. Um, Typically, who do they hire? And do they have a job description to match that? So there's your first step. The interview process, again, ask your professional association from assistance. With this, they can give you a set of questions that would be appropriate. Now, I can say, I'll put my hand up, I'm absolutely shocking at interviewing other people for roles. I think everyone's wonderful. I think the best of people. So I would be absolutely terrible in an HR position. HR experts, there are a number of them who are based here in Hornsby, Karingai, who offer wonderful service. And maybe that's a good idea. Not necessarily they're going to find someone for you. I don't, I'm not a fan of HR agencies, but you could ask for some HR support, HR help, and get some advice on how to hire people. Uh, think about why potential employees would choose you. So you are essentially advertising yourself during the employment process as well. If you've got the perfect candidate sitting in front of you, they are going to be able to pick and choose. If they've got a great CV, they come across well in interviews, you're not the only person that they're selling themselves to. There's others as well. And they are going to be able to choose. So make sure it's believable. When you're sitting across from someone, you need to show them the passion that you have for your business. Not the, oh my God, I'm so exhausted and I desperately need help passion, (laughs) but the other passion, the reason why you're in business and why you love doing it so much. The great thing about working for someone in small business is you, if you're loyal and they're loyal to you, then you can really help grow the business together and you can be there for a very, very long time. It's very appealing to people um, who are potential employees as well. And the government, despite its lack of support, uh, keeps on talking about how small business is the engine room of the economy. It's our biggest hirer in Australia. Um, So remember that we have got that on our side and we should be thinking about that as a selling point when we're talking to potential candidates across the desk from us. Now, um, some employees also recognise that being part of a small team is more rewarding, so you get more um, acknowledgement for the work that you do. Um, And also older staff, um, I'm talking about people in their 40s and 50s and 60s, not only can you actually get some rebates from the government for hiring people uh, over 50, but they appreciate a good boss. (laughs) They've been through some bad bosses, guaranteed, and um, they will work hard for you and, and show that real loyalty. Coming back to that, Um, why people choose small business. One of the reasons why they don't choose small business is because uh, they're nervous that there's no job security. Now, we all know, as small business owners, many of us have moved out of the corporate world. We know that there's no job security in any occupation that you have. It's one of the reasons why we set set up our own business is to produce our own security in, in terms of money. But that is one of the barriers that people have when they're going to work for small business. So you need to consider that. Uh, Make sure that they understand why you're hiring someone, that you're in a growth phase, that you've given this a lot of thought and the reason why you're taking on people is because you need the support and you need the help for the fact that you're growing, not for the fact that, you know, it's going downhill and you need someone to just, you know, hold on to while you drown. Uh, so so make sure that this is a bit of a selling point as well. That's just my tip for for hiring people. Now, I'm going to draw everyone's attention to the National Employment Standards. This is a really important piece of legislation. It's an annoying piece of legislation, which is crazy, busy and very difficult to understand. But um, what I need you to understand is that there's certain legislation things that you need to consider. Number one, the working week is 38 hours for full-time employees. It's not 40 hours. Okay, and then there is also this is and this is for everyone. This is everyone basically falls under the national employment standards. Um, they might not have fall under an award, 
but they all have these set of standards which sets out the minimum entitlements that employees are entitled to, regardless of what the award applies. So you have to um, supply this standard, first of all, when they start. It's actually a piece of paper that you're supposed to give your employees when they begin. And um, it's basically 10 minimum standards. I'm just going to quickly run through these quickly just to make you aware of them. It might be something if you're about to hire someone that you need to go and look at in greater detail. And remember, don't go to a private website. Make sure you go to a public one. Working week is 38 hours for full-time employees plus reasonable additional working hours. So that whole reasonable additional working hours, it's kind of an interesting concept because people who work in corporate would know that 38 hours and plus some can sometimes be plus double. Um, They have a right to request flexible working arrangements. So you have a right to ask for, uh, for, for, I wouldn't say part-time, but just a bit of flexibility when uh, maybe your child is sick and that sort of thing. 12 months unpaid parental and adoption leave with the right to request an additional 12 months. So that is standard. Four weeks paid annual leave, prorated for part-time. 10 days paid personal carer's leave, prorated for part-time. And two days paid compassionate leave for each permissible occasion. And two days unpaid carer's leave for each permissible occasion. Now, that's kind of interesting because I know lots of us have worked in corporate jobs where you've probably needed to have some compassionate leave. Perhaps you were attending a funeral. But it's this bit which says permissible occasion that I think is a bit wishy-washy because I guess your boss could turn around and go, well, it's not permissible, so therefore I'm not giving you the time off. That's a good time to leave, by the way. Uh, Community service leave for jury selection or activities dealing with emergencies or natural disasters. That's going to affect a lot of people around here up in Hornsby because there are a hell of a lot of people who are community service um, participants, particularly in emergency circumstances such as the SES or the RFS. So bear that in mind. Long service leave, there's an entitlement to long service leave in the NES, but the actual granting and payment of long service leave is governed by the Long Service Leave Act in New South Wales. So oddly, the national employment standards talk about employ- a long service leave, but it's administered by the New South Wales Act. So I'm already confused. See, this is why they don't understand what red... The, you only have to listen to this program for five minutes if you're in the government agency to understand what red tape means for small business. Because those of you out there who are thinking, oh, I'd really like to employ someone to help with my sales and marketing. And you're listening to this and you've already switched off at point number three because you're going, this is just too hard. Would it just not be easier to hire a contractor? I'm going to come to the whole employee contractor a little bit later in the show. Public holidays and entitlement to be paid when working on those days. Yep. A notice of termination and redundancy pay. So a notice of redundancy pay is not required um, by small business owners though. Remember that. Um, But then again, the definition of small business does, does change occasionally. So make sure you check into that. And if you have any questions about this, as well as the Fair Work... Um, commissioner, where you can obviously go to the website and ask for more support. You can also um, ask for uh, information from your professional association who should be able to support you in this. And of course, things become rather complex when you're talking about apprentices as well. So again, if you're not part of a professional association, you really need to be, if for no other reason than just to get advice like this. The right for new employees to receive a copy of the Fair Work information statement and that's what I was referring to before you you, that is their right in one of the top well not the top 10 but the 10 national employment standards that you need to meet as an employer so we dipped into a modern awards there when we were talking about that I'm not going to talk about that too much but do understand that there are lots of them (laughs) and more than likely uh, the employer that you're going to take on although you're not a tradie or you're not it's not clerical staff it doesn't have a defined position as far as you're concerned, more than likely they will be covered by a a modern award. So that is an example of where you can contact the Fair Work Commission and ask for some advice. I would say, however, try and get as much of this information as possible in writing. So if you're looking up and conducting a survey in their website and you get a response that gives you an answer, then perhaps it would be worth printing out that response as a PDF and naming it the person that you were thinking of hiring at the time. So you've got that on record as to the advice that this government agency gave you. It is um, a lot of people make these errors as to not putting people onto an award with the correct entitlements and they only find out about it years later and it's it's not not ideal. Uh, Engaging with a new worker. 
So um, this is basically where when you engage with them, where the first time when you when you get them on board, um, you obviously start with <clears throat> an employment contract which they sign and make sure they sign it before they start. So it's very important that the employment contract goes out with them having sufficient time to be able to look at that. Now, you don't need to engage with a $2,000 lawyer to get an employment contract. You can, of course, do that if you want to make sure that you're 1 million percent correct. But there are plenty of great websites, including Legal Vision. We've had Ursula on the show before. Um, Legal Vision has a great free service for small businesses where you enter uh, a few details and it will give you a legal employment contract. It's not going to be as robust and it's not going to be tailored to your organisational needs, but at least it is uh, it is a legal document to make sure that you're meeting your requirements as an employer and they're meeting their em- employments requirements as an employee. Something else you might want to consider when they first walk in the door is a staff manual. Now, this runs alongside your employment contract and you can have some wording in the employment contract that refers to the staff manual which can change. Now this is a document that <clears throat> includes induction procedures, uh, the entire the, the terms and conditions of when they work, what to do in an emergency, what should be part of the induction process, confidentiality, confidentiality and social media policy. Now that's really important. Are you expecting your staff to be able to access social media for the purposes of sales and marketing for your business or is it not relevant to their work and they should just never ever have it on when they are in the office? Those are things that you should stipulate in your staff manual. It's basically how your staff behaves when they are within and working under your roof, or not even under your roof, if if they're working within the hours that you're paying them. How do you expect them to behave? How do you expect them to dress? How do you expect them to uh, communicate with clients? Is there a process and procedure you need them to follow in order for, for, for them to do the right thing by your business? And intermingled with all of these processes and procedures as part of the staff manual is a certain amount of compliance. So an expectation of what they do without pushing the boundaries and expecting too much from them. Your employment contract will say X. You can't override that with what your staff manual says. And let me just put a little tip about employment contracts as well. You can't override national employment standards or an award wage that your employee may be on simply by writing into their contract that you expect them to work 100 hours. There are certain things, your, your employment is common law and, uh, and, or hang on, is it the other way around? I'm not a lawyer, I can't remember. One supersedes the other though. National employment standards supersedes and then the fair work, uh, fair, fair, sorry, the award wages is another really important factor. You can't throw away all of your employees' rights just by writing into their contract, for example, that you expect them to work ridiculous hours and um, with very little pay. It just doesn't work that way. So bear that in mind. So with engaging a new contractor, you need to basically make sure that they are, I guess, uh, making sure that they're settled in before they come in so that they understand what to expect. And that's what a staff manual (coughs) can do for you and what an employment contract should do for you. Now, we're just going to take a quick break now. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about those first few hours, if you will, of when that person walks in the door, because you've got in your head what you're expecting them to do, which is basically, um, you know, you're you're expecting them to do what what you do. (laughs) And remember, of course, that you don't work in your business. You work in your business all the time and you are very aware of what's going on and you have a great deal of knowledge and you're not going to be able to impart that knowledge in the first few minutes of them walking in the door. So it's a good idea to have a process in your head just to ease them in and to make them understand what your expectations are and to meet some of your obligations as well. So let's take a quick break and we'll be back after this and we'll talk more about hiring employees. You are listening to Small Biz Matters, the half hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. This is Triple H 100.1 FM. Now, just before the break, I was telling you a little bit about what to do before an employee walks in the door. Uh, It's actually quite an important time because you need to consider what you're paying them, the conditions under under which they will be working, and making sure that they understand all of this through a solid employment contract. 
Now, once that person walks in the door, of course, it's a very exciting day, first of all. But you've got to remember that you're not going to be changing your business overnight. And this person is not going to be necessarily understanding your business overnight. It's a good idea to have a training plan. Now, a lot of you out there, because you're overworked and you need staff, are not going to have an operations manual in place before you hire someone. But that's okay. This is a great opportunity to start one. I was speaking to a small business colleague the other day who said they brought on an admin manager to help them with their back-end support. And don't forget, admin people are often excellent at social media campaigns as well, so they can be your marketing person as well. And this particular small business owner had a fantastic idea, which was when this person walks in the door and maybe finds their feet after a couple of days... He asked this person to start writing down exactly what they do step by step as they learn it. So as they write notes, which a good new staff member should, they are actually producing your operations manual from scratch. They're learning it from scratch and they're coming at it with very little knowledge and that's exactly what you want to have in a handover document. Now remember with all this documentation, number one, It can go online and it's a good idea to keep it there because this is a lot of work over time, that is. It's not a lot of work in one day. It's a lot of work over time. You don't want to lose that because you've left it on a server that's under the desk and then there's some disaster and you lose everything. This is the sort of documentation that you should definitely keep online and in the cloud. Now, we will talk about the cloud at a, at a later date for those of you who don't quite understand how it works and there, and there are some people out there who are small business owners who have never used it. But in the meantime, I just for those of you who are across the cloud, if you are producing something like this, this is a great thing to go into, um, into the online space. So get this person writing down the instructions that you give them. They type it out and this forms the beginning of your operations manual. So when this person walks in the door, and this is actually a really crucial time, you obviously need to be warm and inviting and um, not bombard them with too much information, but you have a few musts that you need to tick the box with as well. A good solid induction procedure is usually out of the reach of, of someone Uh, who hasn't got the time to create one. But there are plenty of places online that you can go to to get a basic induction process. The important thing you need to show people is the egress, obviously the uh, emergency exits when they're in the case of an emergency. Uh, Due diligence is to show them how to use the kitchen and how to use bits and pieces in the kitchen and and so that they're comfortable, um, especially how to make a cup of tea. Um, you must show them where the bathrooms are. I know this this seems really obvious when you're sitting here going, yeah, of course I'm going to show them where the toilets are. But when you're flustered and you're um, looking forward to having this person start, these are the sort of things that you're going to forget. Um, another important thing to show them on their first day is what to do in the case of an incident. Now, a lot of small business owners will not have thought of having an incident form or a process to follow in the situation where a near miss or an incident where someone is injured actually occurs. This is a good time to think about what you're going to have. Now, if you go to the New South Wales Work Cover website, there is a, a number of resources you can use there, including a downloadable incident report form. It's not a bad idea to just have one of those either in your admin drive or hard copy in the office so that in the case of an emergency, um, that paperwork can be completed rather quickly. You're doing yourself and your employee a favour if, if you make sure that everyone's aware of that. And if you make it part of your induction process, then any new person who walks in the door will be aware of it. So just bear that in mind. Again, check that they have completed their employment contract, that they've signed it, and then give them a copy. That's also some due diligence tip there as well. And um, when you're engaging with them, make sure they're very clear on what your what the expected working hours are. I know from a corporate experience that some people would go for a one hour lunch break when in fact it was written into their contract that they could only have half an hour. So little things like that, just making sure people are aware. The other important part about having a good induction process when people walk in the door is that you look professional. There is nothing worse than going and starting to work for a small business and thinking in your head, well, this is just some little guy and he doesn't really know what he's doing because he's not the corporate world and it's not a big business. And then actually having that reinforced by the fact that this person fumbling around and not quite knowing what they're doing when you're walking in the door. So you have to come across as professional and knowing what you're doing. 
and a good induction process when that person first walks in is important. So we've done the physical induction, we've done the walk through, and you've talked about the contract and the um, and the conditions under which they'll be working. The last part, of course, is teaching them how to use the software or the tools of your trade. Now, it's a good idea to assume no knowledge, and it's a good idea to say, look tell me if I'm going too slowly and you already know this and then we can move faster. And again, if you've had a chance to uh, create an an operations manual, uh, this is a good time to pull that out and work through it with that person. The staff manual that I talked about before the break is a a really good uh, talking point as well. You can sit down with them for about 15 or 20 minutes and actually walk them through the staff manual. Now, your staff manual is going to be a significant document. And let's be honest, um, a lot of people are not going to have the time nor the inclination to read that before they sign it. Now, if you've sat down with them for a few minutes and talked them through what your expectations are as, as you're sitting there together, and then they sign it, then you have really done due diligence. And if you've got it written down that that's part of your induction process somewhere, then you have really, really done due diligence. I do talk a lot about processes and procedures, and it's probably a bit of an old-fashioned term. Now, I went to a great seminar the other day with uh, the Blueprint um, Blueprint for Business. No, I'm, I'm going to get that wrong. Business Business Blueprint, sorry. A group that uh, produces and gets people underway and gets them working as part of a processes and procedures kind of system. That's a really bad way of looking. Look at their website. Look at their website. But basically, they said, don't forget about video instructions, Now, this is nuts, but they had a video for everything. I'm talking about how to use the microwave, how to use the coffee pod machine. I mean, it was a bit bit nuts, but I guess when you've got 100 people using a coffee pod machine, it seems a bit silly to train every single one of them when they can just go onto the internet and find a video on how to use that particular coffee machine. Bit impersonal... Not, a, I mean, it's nice for someone else who's a buddy in your workplace or your boss to actually talk to you, but it is an example of the way that you can use video to do instructions. So if you've got a particular tool that you use and you've been using for a number of years and you're obviously very good at, and it's maybe a dangerous tool, then why not video yourself using that from where to go? you know, sort of five minute video and talking through the process and do it slowly and clearly and then putting that up on perhaps your own personal YouTube channel or something. And then that's a resource that your staff, your future staff can use. Now, it is an old fashioned term process and procedures, but you can bring it into the 21st century by um, using the technology that you have in that magical device called your phone. It's it's a really important tool to have um, and it's something that you can do without really creating too much work for yourself, which is really handy. Don't forget all of these processes and procedures when they are put together really add value to your business. It's a fantastic tip for succession planning. And it's uh, if you're th- considering five years, 10 years down the track, it adds value to your business and it makes it a saleable commodity. So do think about putting those in one place and having a bit of an organized fashion. Even if you've just got, you know, one folder in your Google Drive or in your Dropbox or on your desktop that just says says induction, or maybe it just says HR, or maybe it just says, you know, processes and procedures, or even just admin. Even if you're just dumping things into that folder to begin with, then later down the track, you can start sorting it into more logical folders. And those folders might be insurances, uh, HR, motor vehicles, um, trying to think of some of the other admin things that are covered, um, induction procedures, uh, bookkeeping, finance. So you can break down those that uh, folder structure into smaller and smaller folders. But in the meantime, when you're producing something for new employees, do it in a video and just pop it into that folder. It's a great resource to have. And as I said, it does add value to your business. Now, just before we go today, I'm just going to talk about one topic, which is really, really, really complicated. Well, it's not complicated, but it's um, it's talked about a lot, I should say. It's, it's, it's really in the media and it's talked about a lot. And a lot of businesses are a bit fearful about hiring people or engaging with a contractor because they're concerned they're going to do the wrong thing according to this law. Now, there is an employee versus contractor regulation. I guess you would call it, that uh, it comes under two, and you've got to remember this comes under two banners. It comes under employment law and it also comes under taxation law. So a lot of people are directed to the ATO website. There's an employee versus contractor tool 
and that helps you to determine whether or not this person should be considered an employee for taxation reasons. That covers you for the taxation law. It doesn't cover you for employment law. So when you're considering hiring or or you're, you're tossing up between hiring or engaging within a contractor, make sure that you somehow check both of those pieces of legislation because it's okay to say, well, that person, as far as the ATO is concerned, is a contractor, but you might get stung if the Fair Work Ombudsman can audit you. And by the way, they can audit to say, well, no, this person, as far as we're concerned, is actually an employee. So make sure that you engage again with an HR expert or again with uh, the Fair Work um, commissioner in, through their website to try and determine that and print everything out. That tool I was talking about earlier, the employee versus contractor tool on the ATO website, complete it, print it as a PDF and name the document the person you were thinking of. Even if you did six months before you were thinking of hiring them. Oh, but having said that, I should just correct myself there. I've noticed uh, as a bookkeeper that that tool changes. It actually, uh, either the way that they're, they're putting it on the website and the way you interact with it, or maybe it's the questions, I don't know, but it does change slightly. So if it has been six months since you've done the tool and then you're thinking about a different person or the same role again, go back and complete the tool again, just to be sure, and again, print it out. So that's just a little bit of a tip trying to determine one or the other. Now, a couple of misnomers that are still floating around in small business um, circles about the whole employee versus contractor. The 80-20 rule no longer applies. So it doesn't matter that the other person is working for other people. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter that they're working for you, um, you know, more than 80% or less than 20%. It does, it, forget about the 80-20 rule. It's, it's not a thing anymore. Um, you need to determine this, this via the, the employee versus contractor tool. The, the decision tool is broken into four th- elements. So you've got delegation. Um, can the person delegate this work to sub- or subcontract this to another person? rectification. When things go wrong, who is responsible? Control. Who controls the task and what standard is being set and who sets those standard hours? And integration. Whose tools are they using? Do they understand the relationship between the the client and you and the work? So that's basically what the decision-making tool is and, and the survey tries to ask those questions to help you determine those things. I mean, those are some pretty long words there. You wouldn't want to try and figure that out in a wishy-washy way. You need to have a tool and that's what the tool's there for. <clears throat> so um, basically, you need to be aware of employment law and taxation law. That's what I want you to take away from this. Yes, you can complete the employee versus contractor tool on the ATO website, but you need to be across that employment law. I mean, you know, we're not lawyers. It's it's a crazy set of um, legislation that you wouldn't try and get your head around, but at least make the effort to try and figure out um, through a government website whether or not that person is an employee or a contractor. Um, so... Once you've determined that, you, of course, if you had to hire someone as an employee, you can, of course, do it um, where they're a casual employee. So you don't have to uh, do any um, annual leave or sick leave entitlements, but you obviously have to pay them accordingly because they're not getting those entitlements. And there's, as I don't forget about the 10 national standards that everyone um, despite which, which modern award they're covered, there are certain minimum requirements for employment that you must meet. And in terms of the agreement, once you employ someone or you bring on someone as a contractor, for example, you still should have a good solid agreement with that person that covers basically the same sort of stuff that employment does without the employment law. I mean, it covers things like social media. Are you expecting them to be able to, when they're under, when they're working for you, do those sort of things? What happens about confidentiality? That's a really important part that people forget about. And I know of a lot of small businesses who engage with contractors and don't have any such contract with that person. So it's really important to cover yourself. And another one to think about is if you're employing someone or as a contractor or you're bringing them on as a contractor, you need to make sure there's a clause uh, that stops them from approaching clients within a 12-month or whatever is reasonable, a 12-month period of when they finished working for you because you don't want them building a relationship with your clients and then starting their own business and taking that client with you. Now, if you don't have an agreement that's signed um, either with an employee, which would be crazy, or a contractor, which would also be crazy, then you're really opening yourself up for those sort of things to happen. 
And remember, it's not the lovely people you've got now. It's the really horrible person that's on their way that you need to protect yourself against. So thanks for listening. I have been Alexi Boyd. You've been listening to Small Biz Matters, the half-hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. I look forward to speaking to you next week. This is Triple H 100.1 FM.